So when we last left off, Dash Noah had become a runaway graffiti writer living day to day in New York City. And he had met and eventually moved in with budding photographer and best friend Ryan McGinley. McGinley admits that this time marked the beginning of an almost uninterrupted intoxication. All night coke binges and blackout drinking, Snow himself would end up marrying close friend and on again off again girlfriend Agat Snow at the age of 18. Agat was a Corsican who did not have papers to stay in the United States and worked as a waitress in her mother's downtown restaurant. This used to be a restaurant called La Poem, who was owned by this woman named Martine. Martine is the mother of Agat. Agat was Dash's first wife, and so they dated for forever, and we hung out on a bench right here, basically, like, from like seven o'clock until, you know, we got coke or like, you know, we went out to write graffiti. But there was this fashion house called As4, right? And so Agat, when she broke up with Dash, right? Or maybe Dash broke up with her or whatever, um, she started dating this dude from As4. So what did Dash do, being like a graffiti writer, you know, his pride was hurt. And so um, Dash kind of like pours a bottle of Griffin shoe polish. Um, you know, it was like, it's like ink almost. And it went all over his fucking face. And the guy's face was black for like a month. It had like, like it was like light purple, you know, like trying to clean it. It was like crazy. And that happened like right here. He like waited for the dude to come by and he was like, oh word. And he was like, and the dude was mad respectful and nice and trying to be respectful to Dash and stuff and not trying to be like, you know, he's like, oh, but, you know, Dash. It was hilarious though. I felt so bad. And that was like kind of like when we stopped chilling here. The young couple became a subject of McGinley's work. Agat herself is an artist famous for videos of all night dancing marathons, among other things. My name is Agat Snow. And I'm a sculptress, installationist. I don't know what else I make things with things. I've made are these creatures that say yes. They're all boggle heads, basically. They all say yes, no, yes, yes. I, I love the perseverance of humankind and like the resilience. Like no matter what happens, we always get back up and keep on moving. And I just like I don't know. I love every everything, even in sleep. Like the move, like kind of weird movements people make when they sleep, and especially repeated like things that just go on and on and on and on. So if I could have one, yeah, maybe this. <laughs> there was windmill. McGinley began to amass a large library of images of his downtown artist and party animal friends. Snow, who himself already had a large collection of Polaroids, was encouraged by McGinley to keep going and to consider that he may in fact be an artist. Snow was a reluctant acceptor of this title. In typical style, he felt that it made him inauthentic. During this time, another young artist came along, Dan Colon, who would also be a subject of both Snow and McGinley's pictures, such as this one called Dan Dusted, taken after Colon had stayed up all night smoking angel dust. Colin had been a childhood friend of McGinley's from New Jersey. Dan, too, joined in encouraging Dash to consider himself an artist and pursue it further. Dan also contributed to the legend by making a collage piece based on a wall in Snow's apartment, which was covered in various newspaper clippings and other detritus Snow had found and attached to his wall. The three guys fed off each other and those around them, becoming part of a movement documenting the downtown New York youth scene during the time just before and after 9-11. 9-11 would play a major role in the group's aesthetic. The paranoid and dark times that followed would certainly be reflected in their work. Snow and McGinley, along with their friends, floored the area downtown where the towers had fell and the surrounding area which was now covered in dust, soot, and debris. Aside from the obvious major changes after 9-11, the city was also in flux. It became less bohemian and more of a tourist destination, filling with glass-encased condos and undergoing other modes of homogenization. As the guys continued to party and make work, they began to receive notoriety and art world attention. McGinley, ever the ambitious one, had caught the attention of Robert Maplethorpe's former lover, Jack Walls. Walls used his contacts to help McGinley gain entrance into the art world. With that, McGinley also brought his friends. McGinley was also an early photo editor at Vice Magazine, placing many of his photographs, including those taken of Snow, in some of the issues. By 2005, Snow, McGinley, and Colin had begun showing their works and generating buzz. People seemed to be split on Snow. Either he was one of the last genuine downtown New York City artists or a rich boy living off his family name. Irregardless, the three guys began to receive success. McGinley and Snow were included in a 2006 Whitney Biennale while Colin sold some of his works for six-figure prices to mega collector Charles Saatchi. With this success came more drugs and partying, in particular for Snow. Dash and Agat had split up, and he began dating magazine editor Jade Biro, with whom he had his only child, Secret Snow. As time went on, it seemed that the partying lifestyle could not continue for some. Colin and McGinley began to change their ways, becoming more professional, cleaning up their acts. It was hard, however, for Snow to stop using drugs, in particular heroin. The art world buzz and success continued, however. Snow and his friends were the subject of a major piece in a New York magazine. Some felt the piece maligned Snow as a wannabe and a faker. But, as they say, no press is bad press, and it helped to enhance his image. 
In addition to displaying photographs, Snow also made collages and other sculptural pieces, sometimes using his own semen, which he would then throw glitter on. These pieces in particular drew the ire of some critics asking how much talent it really took to do this. Snow struck back by taking the sentence and blowing it up and inviting random people off the internet to come on it, thus creating a response piece. I know this seems childish and is not necessarily my favorite work of Snow's, but these were not the only collages that he made. As the popularity of the three was at its zenith, Snow and Colin were to make one of their infamous hamster's nest. The hamster's nest had been something Snow and Colin had done before in hotel rooms. They shredded phone books and other paper, throwing it all over, similar to the paper used in hamster cages, then took a bunch of drugs before escaping the room before they were caught. So when Jeffrey Deitch approached us about doing it in his space, we were pretty skeptical of it. You know, the only way it could work is if it, his gallery was our gallery. And so he gave us the keys, you know, for, for, and for a week we, we lived in there, basically, you know, and, uh, and it, you know, it's like one of these things that I'll cherish, having been able to, like, create that situation with him. The first night, uh, Jeffrey helped us get interns, and so I, we still have pictures of, like, 20 kids shredding phone books, but the space is really big, you know? And so uh, we did that, but we eventually, Jeffrey found this truck. It'll go to JP Morgan or whatever, you know, like, and it'll, they'll bring out all their documents that they need shredded once a month. So it came and shredded like 20,000 phone books in an afternoon. Some of our, some of our uh, friends play music and, uh, and maybe, you know, it was pretty limited, like who we invited. It wasn't like an op it wasn't a public opening, you know, and so maybe there was a hundred people in there. But it was so disgusting. People were pissing in it and just like beer and you know, whatever. There's some people who think we should just leave this open permanently. You know, like the Walter D. Maria birth room on Worcester Street. We should keep this as the New York dirt room. Snow's daughter was born in 2007 and became the subject of his work, including a new direction for him, film. Snow, however, could not kick his demons. Never being able to stay sober longer than a month, he slipped back down the rabbit hole to heroin. High on dope and then nodding out trying to go to sleep at like 5 in the morning and my girlfriend called me and found out I was nodding out and dumped me. That, that's, that, I'd say that that's a good reason to cry though. As his drug habit worsened, his friends became worried and his girlfriend decided he needed an intervention. While having lunch with friends, Biro got a call from Snow that said, I love you, I'll see you on the other side. They rushed to the Lafayette house, a hotel in the East Village that Snow had been staying at, and broke down the door with the hotel staff. It was too late. Snow had overdosed on heroin in the bathtub at the age of 27 years old. Obviously, old friends and members of the art world mourned the loss greatly. Snow's old friend, McGinley, wrote an obituary lamenting the loss of his friend. He did, however, admit that Snow's fate was not altogether surprising to him. Snow had long had a dark and fatalistic side combined with drugs that seems almost inevitable to those who knew him well. So what keeps you alive? Four big bottles of water a day, two packs of Marlboro Reds, and I don't. I, what keeps me alive? Shit. Um, music. I, can, I have to listen to music all day long. I'd say that, that keeps me going. I'm a pretty dark person. I've thought about ending it a million times, and I have to say that music keeps me here. By far, the main thing. That's what I wish I did do was music, but I just. I just haven't got there yet. Maybe one day. I was very impressed with Dash. And today I try to take photographs like he did. I mean, he just put his camera there. I saw him do it. I don't know how he knew what he was getting, but, you know, he had a Polaroid and he always just put it out one side or the other. Most of his pictures were done like that, very casually. The work of Snow lives on, being subject of several exhibitions after his death, including one at the Brandt Foundation. McGinley is now a well-known photographer frequently featured in magazines of all kinds. Colin continues to make art, but moved out of the city and bought a farm upstate. Snow's partner and mother of his child lives together with their daughter in Brooklyn. Maybe she will someday pursue art. Snow seems to be the classic story of an artist who burned too bright, and his loss is obviously sad. However, the movement that surrounded him and his close friends proves that New York City can still be an incubator for a genuine artistic movement. 
As a final note, I would like to add that Snow's authenticity has been challenged many times. His privileged background is often cited, as well as the seemingly childish nature of his work. Additionally, Snow and his friends have been labeled as a typical boys club of art world success. While these points are certain valid criticism, it still must be noted the intense work ethic and vast body of work created by Snow. Supposedly, the archive of unshown Polaroids is immense. However, a true valuation of his work cannot be cataloged, as Snow often gave away his photographs. As far as the subject matter, dirty apartments, drug taking, and nudity can all be dismissed as juvenile, but my question is, who will capture these times? The life portrayed in Snow's work represents the fleeting freedom of being young. This time in people's life often slips right through their fingers. It serves to capture a dark beauty in the chaos and mess. The beauty of unvarnished life in a society increasingly concerned with a polished image and a carefully created social media campaign. Snow obviously had the ability to connect with anyone, no matter who they were, and photograph them, a champion of beauty and those who otherwise would be considered anything but. Whether Snow's life and work was one long con or genuine, I suppose remains up to you to decide. Perhaps, however, Snow being free of the burdens of money and a regular life full of mundane responsibilities allowed him to capture more of what we often miss, what slips through our fingers as we grow up and become adults. Many trust fund kids use their privilege to sit on their asses and accomplish nothing, or they buy their way into the art world with mediocre work. And for those who dismiss work as childish and sophomoric, I ask you, what is good work then? Work that can only be understood with an art history degree? Art that is dense and inaccessible? Again, I'll leave this up for you to decide.